Uh, what I would like to talk about here today are the practical implications for mature, established, large companies. Uh, based on uh, my research on innovation, venture capital, funding of innovation. And uh, it's based on my research, teaching, as well as on working with, uh, yeah, this doesn't work. Uh, as well as um, working with a lot of companies, individuals, entrepreneurs, or investors in Silicon Valley. And let me start by uh, telling you just a little bit about what venture capital is. Uh, so venture capital, thank you very much. So uh, venture capitalists are investors that invest in new, young, entrepreneurial companies with uh, technological ideas that face very substantial risks. And most of them fail, but those who succeed, succeed greatly. And here is the latest data based on uh, my research. If we look at the United States, and if we look at all companies that went public in the United States for the past 40 years, and this will be, of course, thousands of companies, then uh, what are the companies that are funded by venture capital? What we find out is that almost half, 43%, of all those companies that did go public in the United States are companies that are funded by venture capitalists. So those companies that are innovative, entrepreneurial companies, they have now have almost 60% of market capitalization in the United States. They employ 40% of employees. And I think most amazingly, if you look at their research and development expense, then those companies spend 82 cents of each dollar that is spent by public companies in the United States. So this is the industry that had a huge economic impact in the past 40 years. And where is this industry located? Well, this is the map of the United States as you know it. This is not the map that applies to venture capital. That is the real map. So it is disproportionately located in California. And in fact, it is located in that very small strip of land that is um, Silicon Valley, which is really the strip of land between um, the cities of San Francisco and San Jose. And Stanford University is exactly in the middle of that strip, of that Silicon Valley, and Stanford University is really where Silicon Valley started. Now, you've all heard about what um, Silicon Valley and venture capital did, because all of you use either iPhone or Android uh, devices. They, of course, came from Apple or Google that was started in Silicon Valley and were funded by venture capitalists. Of course, we all use internet and so on and so on forth. But in reality, what most people outside Silicon Valley, and definitely outside the United States, don't realize, is that what's happening these days in Silicon Valley, what venture capitalists fund these days, is going to have huge, tremendous consequences for mature, traditional industries that so far, by, by far and large, have been isolated from the effect of technology, digitization, and so on. And I'm talking about industries such as agriculture, such as mining, such as construction, such as real estate and development, such as healthcare, such as education, such as financial industries. Those industries, the ones that I mentioned and many others, will undergo dramatic changes in the next several years, three to 10 years. Some of these changes are already occurring in front of our eyes. Let me give you just one example. Uh, people everywhere talk about disruption. In Silicon Valley, people talk about unbundling. I'm not sure how this word translates into English, uh, into Spanish. Unbundling means that you take an existing industry, you take an existing company, and you basically take all the margins that this company earns from it. So the company disappears. And this is happening right now in many companies. Let me give you one example. I have many, but we don't have a lot of time. I'm sure you've heard about this bank. This is Wells Fargo. And this is by now the second largest commercial bank in the United States and uh, one of the top five banks in the world. What this is, is the um, web page. This is the web page. So if you go to and, and, and Google Wells Fargo, and go to wellsfargo.com, this is what you will see. And of course, there's a lot of things that the bank does. Loans, payments, transfers, retirement accounts, small business loans. 
And what this shows is that for everything that is on their web page, everything that they do without single exception, there are now up to five startups for each line in Silicon Valley and beyond that try to take their business away. This page shows 120 startups that are all funded by venture capital of Silicon Valley that are trying to take the business of Wells Fargo away. And in some, they already succeed. They've already been successful in some of these lines. In some, they have not yet been that successful. For example, in uh, loans, they already took away about 2% of uh, Wells Fargo business. Now, you can say 2%, who cares about 2% of Wells Fargo business? Wells Fargo loan book is more than $1 trillion. So if they lose 2%, but the growth rate was about 100%. So just in the past 12 months, Wells Fargo lost 1%. So if it goes at the same rate that Wells Fargo loans book, we'll lose maybe about 50% over the next five years. And the same goes to every single line. And this is just to show you what venture capital does. And this is just one example. If you take large agricultural companies, large construction companies, large mining companies, you will see amazingly enough that in the industries that were far, far away from internet and from technology per se, you will see a lot of things happening that potentially will unbundle or make these businesses basically lose their margins. And so what I would like to talk today about what we can learn from, from, Silicon, from Silicon Valley and how to, what to do about it, okay? Now, how do venture capitalists do it? It's, as an industry, it's been extremely successful. Well, first of all, it's actually a very small industry. What you see here is that capital under management um, in the United States for all venture capital funds. And um, as of now, it's about $250 billion. It's very small, in fact. Um, a large pension fund in the United States or a large mutual fund or a large private equity fund would be of this size, just one fund. And this is the total industry. So what happens is that actually they invest very little amount of money, small amounts, but they invest in thousands and thousands of companies. Every single day, about 500 companies, startups, sometimes just three or four founders, get money from venture capitalists. So if you multiply this, number of startups a day, number of business days a year, and sometimes weekends count too, because obviously nobody sleeps there, Okay, then you will get thousands and thousands of companies. Now, most of these companies will fail. The rate of failure in Silicon Valley is about 90 to 95 percent. But of course, those that succeed, succeed greatly. And I will talk a little bit about that in the future, okay? Uh, if you want to take one message from Silicon Valley, this is, I love failure. Now, if you can imagine a mature company, if you're, you know, you're a director or senior officer at a company, and your engineer, your uh, chief engineer officer, let's say you are maybe a mining company, will say, I have a great project that potentially can increase our productivity, but it will fail with 95% chance. What will you say to it? Okay. Well, this is exactly what's happening. Now, an important question to ask is, how can an industry that has a 95% failure rate can succeed? Is it possible? Well, it is possible. Here's an example of the session industry. This is how they do it. They invest, as I already said, in a lot of companies. They know that most of them will fail. So they take a portfolio approach. They invest a little bit of money into many, many companies. When they invest a little bit of money, that means that many of these companies will fail, but those they don't will need more money. On average, a successful Silicon Valley venture capital by company will raise about five rounds of funding from venture capitalists. So you invest a little bit of money initially, and this will allow you just to learn. It will not allow you to build a company. It will allow you to, to learn whether, in fact, it makes sense to give more money to this, to this founding team, whether this idea makes sense. So whenever you, when you invest initially, you don't really know whether this idea makes sense. Most of ideas actually don't make sense, okay? And then you learn over the next maybe six to 12 months period, and if this idea makes sense, 
then more money is being invested. And then, of course, if the idea makes sense and then you get customers, etc., then you will raise even more and more money. And sometimes you will raise hundreds of millions of dollars of money. And at this point, I've mentioned thousands and thousands of companies uh, in Silicon Valley, but uh, as of last count, I counted last week, there were 110, 109 um, companies in Silicon Valley that are called unicorns, that are startups funded by venture capitalists that are valued more than $1 billion. So those are companies that initially got $50,000 of funding, and then they survive through all those ruthless stages. So this is how venture capitalists make money. They take a portfolio approach. And I'm going to claim that successful, large established companies that would like to participate in innovation and do not want to disappear in 10 years down the road should take what, this approach as well. And I will talk later about how this can happen, okay? Because they take this approach, they incentivize venture capitalists, incentivize their entrepreneurs that they fund to take risks. So if you would like to remember one picture from this presentation, this is the picture to remember. So entrepreneurs take huge amounts of risks. Because if they fail, they will not get anything. But if they don't fail, then uh, what I call very high powered incentives. So they will get very substantial profits. Entrepreneurs, the founding team, typically, when their companies go IPO or acquired, they get about 30% on average of the value. So the rest goes to venture capitalists. But 30% out of $1 billion is a lot of money. And by the way, if they fail, then because of the culture of failure or the culture of constructive failure, what happens is that if they fail, they will just start another company again. It's interesting that on average in Silicon Valley, entrepreneurs start 3.5 companies. So there are serial entrepreneurs. And this is very difficult to imagine in other parts of the world. I'm doing a lot of, I have not yet done study on Chile, but I'm doing a lot of study about ecosystems in India, in uh, uh, France, in uh, Singapore, in China, in Russia, in Ireland. And single most important difference between Silicon Valley and the rest of the world is how is the approach, the cultural approach to failure. So if you fail uh, in a company, let's say in France, then you'd better not start another company. Actually, you would not be allowed to do so. If you're a board member in France of a failed company, you would not be able to become a board member for the next 10 years. Uh, this, of course, completely changes incentives. In Silicon Valley, if you're a failed entrepreneur, but uh, just because maybe your idea was too crazy, maybe the market was not there, maybe you were too early, the venture capitalists would be lucky, would be really, lo would love to, uh, to fund another idea of yours, okay? And this brings me to the point of what is really a startup? Because I think outside Silicon Valley, uh, and I've witnessed this a lot because I work a lot with large companies around the world, the idea of startup is misunderstood. What I would like you to think of startups in Silicon Valley as experiments, which is there's a business idea and typically, when there's a business idea, these days, venture capitalists and other investors, such as angel investors, seed investors, who invest at a very, very early stage, they don't really take a stand on whether this idea is good or not, because they don't know. It takes very low amount of money to, to experiment, typically, in almost all the industries these days, in almost all the spaces. So you provide very low cost, and you, get, you experiment. How do you experiment? Well, that depends on the space, but in most spaces these days, you get your prototype, very low cost, and then you get customer feedback, sometimes without a, without a prototype at all. So you get a business idea, you say, well, if I'm going to have this product, will you buy it from me? They contact customers, customers provide feedback, and then there is uh, iteration. If this works, if there's at least one customer who says, I'm interested, then they will get, this founding team will get initial funding. It's very, very capital light. I will show you some numbers later, how much capital it takes this, this, these days. And then you run an experiment. As a result of this experiment, you typically build a prototype. And again, it depends on the industry. If it's mobile app, you will build an app. If it's healthcare, you will go through phase one uh, trial. If it's in hardware, you can build with 3D a prototype. 
if it's data analytics, you can build uh, your, your beta version of the application in the cloud and so on and so forth. And then you get your customers. And these days customers are very willing to experiment. And also it's very cheap these days to get global customers as opposed only to local customers. And you will see customers' feedback and, ability and, and uh, feed, uh, not only feedback, but customers' interest and attract, attraction to the idea very quickly. And if positive, then more, more funds are injected. Sometimes startups that start with 50 or $100,000 in six or nine months demonstrate that the prototype works, customers are interested, even though there's still kind of nothing to buy, and then the startups will get five to $10 million in six months. And if negative, then basically startups close. Experiment is over, or maybe there will be rapid adjustments made. Because a founding team sometimes learn on the, on the spot. Let me give you a concrete example. Uh, I teach venture capital class at Stanford to, to MBA students, and one of the requirements of the class, they have to start their own business idea. Okay? So I have 70 students and uh, approximately 40 business ideas a year. Most of these ideas fail, they're students after all, but at least five of these ideas already became multi-billion dollar companies. So one of the ideas was uh, to help airlines maximize profits. So if you're familiar with the airline industry, this is one of the lowest marginal, one of the worst industries really to be if you're a businessman. Uh, and even if you increase margins by like 2%, it's huge. So uh, they had an idea to uh, initially to help customers choose airlines. They got 50,000 of funding from one of the graduates of the Stanford Business School. They spent four months trying to contact customers, such as you, such as you, you know, where you fly a lot, okay? And it turned out that customers were not interested. So the idea kind of, they spent $50,000, there were three of them. But in fact, what is interesting is that as a part of this process, they talked to airlines. And what they realized is that customers are not interested. But airlines are very interested, because airlines understood, like United Airlines, one of the largest airlines in, in the United States, realized that this potentially can increase our margins like by a couple of percent. As a result, this business is now thriving. These three students are now co-founders of uh, a business that already received $25 million of funding from venture capitalists. And they don't deal with airline customers, as they initially thought but they now deal with airlines. They now have 17 airlines as their customers. By the way, these students had zero airline experience in the airline industry in the past. And you can observe this again and again that most successful companies in Silicon Valley, their founders typically, do not have specific experience. Like most successful startups in the financial technology sector that I showed to you that I tried to unbundle banks, they don't have very, a lot of experience in the finance because they come with new bright ideas. And they create this minimum viable products. If you come to Silicon Valley, then people talk about MVPs a lot, minimum viable product. And the point is that it's very, very low cost to develop. It's low time, so basically develop it very quickly. And you can validate it very, very quickly, okay? So I already provided this example of my VC course. We now have a startup garage in uh, Stanford GSB. This is just one example, of course, of hundreds in Silicon Valley where every single quarter there's about 20 to 25 projects that students across Stanford campuses do. And again, there are a lot of um, in interesting ideas that received multi-million dollar VC funding later on. And what is interesting, so I observed this and I worked with this garage, startup garage, for the past four years. What I observed is that it all starts with mobile apps, social networks, something that, you know, very familiar to students. But these days, there are applications that are very difficult to think about. How can you create something with very low cost, quick time, and quick customer validation, something like in healthcare or in, um, um, in construction, real estate development, or in educational space? Amazingly enough, there are, or hardware. Amazingly enough, half of all the startups coming from this garage are in the sectors where you kind of, even a couple of years ago, would not have imagined a quick turnaround, either in time or in cost, and it's now and it is now possible. And the question I think that is important for you to understand is why are so many industries being disrupted now 
and why I'm going to claim whoever you are from whatever space you're coming, your industries, is going to disrupt uh, sooner or later. And I would say sooner than later. And here's the reason why. So here's based on my research, my analysis. Uh, what is the cost of experimenting? What is the cost of starting a startup in various industries in Silicon Valley? Um, I'm not sure whether you can see. So in 2005, whatever startup you wanted to start, you needed $5 million of funding. Now, who could provide $5 million? Only large investors, large venture capitalists, or maybe private equity. Like individual people like as me couldn't provide $5 million. And therefore, there was no low cost of experimenting. You had to justify ideas. You had to write 100 pages business plans. You had to get references and so on. And why did, do you need $5 million? Well, as an example is, uh, one of my uh, students, when I first came to Stanford many years ago, one of my students had an idea to open and uh, to, to start a company that would sell secondhand cars online. Okay, that is one of huge business, and I'm sure it must be a large business in Chile too. But it's a huge business in the United States. And uh, uh, well, he needed five million dollars to start because he needed to have a, a rental office. He needed to uh, buy a, a million dollar Oracle system. He needed to start with 20 uh, software engineers and so on. So he just needed $5 million just to start, okay? It all changed, it all changed very quickly. In 2010, my estimates show, for the same idea, you just needed $2 million. Because what happened between 2005 and 2010 is that you started outsourcing software engineers. So now, you could get the same quality of engineers as in the United States from the, you know, to, to start the company uh, let's say in India, or in or in Russia, or in Eastern Europe. What happened between 2010 and 2013 is that uh, cloud appeared for the first time. So in 2013, startups started using clouding, which is they did not need to buy Oracle systems any longer. And in 2015, uh, about a thousand startups in Silicon Valley that I reviewed from all sorts of industries, maybe with potential with one exception of biotech, needed just $50,000 to start. So now, now people like me, who are like upper middle class people in the United States, can fund as well. There is now in Silicon Valley only about 4,000 so-called angel investors. And you, I guess, all could be angel investors. Just giving $50,000 to people whom you like, uh, who have sometimes very crazy ideas. What this means is that crazy ideas who would never have been able to get $5 million before because they would not have passed validation of any kind receive no money. So have you heard about uh, Uber? I'm sure you have. We actually used it, uh, Ivan and I use it today to, to drive from our hotel. Well, actually, sorry, we used it yesterday, okay? Today we tried to use it, okay. Uh, but we used it yesterday, okay, to, to drive to the hotel. Now, this was a completely crazy idea. It's a market that never existed before. And it did start with $50,000, just so that you understand. Venture capitalists did not give it $5 million or $50 million. It started with two angel investors, each giving the founders uh, $25,000 a piece, so $50,000. Of course, now they raised you know, billions of dollars, in, okay? But it doesn't matter. What matters is, that nowadays crazy ideas can get funded. So I'm interested in financial technology and educational technology, okay, given that I'm professor of finance at Stanford. And I'm now uh, funded as an angel investor about 12 startups. And I don't have a lot of, you know, I'm not very rich, so I give like $50,000 at most. And I would not have, I would never be able to do it 10 years ago, just because $50,000 would be nothing. What is really interesting is that this year, I think it's going to be free, kind of, almost. So students in my venture capital class uh, get some money. So our generous alumni donate some money. But they have to um, talk to between 100 and 1,000 customers and get a prototype just using less than $10,000. And many of them succeed. They may succeed at failure. They may just use $10,000 to find out that their project doesn't work. But you know, that is kind of also, you're learning quite a lot. 
If you look at the history of the United States financial markets, that every single 30 years, top 10 companies change. If you look at top 10 companies in the United States today, then they, many of them, like such as Google or Facebook, did not exist 30 years ago. What I'm going to claim, what my research suggests, is that the speed of this will change dramatically. So I think that biggest companies will now change every 10 years. And many successful companies that exist now will fail in the near future. Now, my research is mostly on European and American companies, but I'm sure that you can translate this to Chile as well yourself. Why this is the case? The reason is that because large established companies are typically pretty bad at the sort of innovation I'm talking about. And they're bad because corporate governance and culture that exists in these companies isn't structured well. And I guess this is where you come in and I come in, and why I came here is because you are board directors and senior officers of companies. And if you believe that your company may be unbundled or disrupted five to 10 years down the road, then you'd better think about how to survive in this world of disruption and how to innovate better. And to understand this, I would like to introduce two types of innovation. And one type of innovation you're pretty good at, and one type I'm going to claim you're pretty bad at. There are two types of innovation. The first one is called exploitation of innovative resources. What is exploitation? Well, an example of exploitation is Intel. When Intel invented chips for the first time, you know, silicon, silicon chips, that was dramatic revolution. But nowadays it takes 10, of $10 billion to, to improve chips just a little bit. And Intel is the best company in the world that's doing it because they have all the resources, capabilities, but they improve it a little bit. It's incremental, marginal, step by step. And because large companies have all these human resources, they know the processes, they can define this incremental innovation pretty well. Well, I call it exploitation and not innovation. Exploration, on the other hand, is a real innovation. It's radical, disruptive innovation. It's something that did not really exist before, or it's something that will change your business model or your product dramatically, something that will open your market. An example of Uber is obviously exploration. And large companies are generally bad at it. And why? Well, you typically mature companies failure, favor exploitation, so incremental innovation, because failure rate is low, because outcomes are much more certain, and also, I'm sure you have the budgetary process, where if you have many divisions, you know, managers will bid for the allocation of resources, and um, the exploitation or step-by-step -step change can, f can fit this budgetary process much better. And also, and this is where you come in, uh, if, I'm going to, if I'm an R&D, research and development engineer in your company, and I'm going to come in and explain what I'm going to do, if I'm going to say I'm going to improve my product a little bit, it'll be much easier for me to explain to you what I'm going to do, and you will understand how it's going to affect your company, what the cost is going to be, what the outcome is going to be. With exploration, it's much more difficult to explain. Also, and importantly enough, in exploitation, we typically know who did what, how to compensate people. The specific manager did this, another manager did that, an engineer did that. With exploration, typically it's a team-based effort, so it's very difficult to think about who is doing what. So in exploitation, there's no need for these high-powered incentives that startup founders have. Okay? And also, the R&D departments, if you have one, typically do not like minimal viable products. Engineers like perfection. So I worked with uh, a huge company in the United States that all of you know, and uh, their engineers are the best engineers in the world, but they like perfection. They just, un they don't have the startup mentality. Startup mentality is, we don't care about the quality, we just need to put out something there. We'll see how it works, if it doesn't work, we'll just change it. The large company is, we're going to iterate infinitely within our company before we can come to the manager and say, this is perfect, okay? Well, this misses the stuff because by the time you do it, the customers may want something else. And also, and this is one of the biggest lessons that we've learned studying innovation, is that true innovation 
comes on, based on team-based effort, where people from different with different skills, different knowledge backgrounds come together. But organizations these days are typically department-based rather than team-based. So there will be a sales department, there will be a finance department, there will be an engineering department. And uh, the communications between them is typically far from perfect in large organizations. And finally, very often, it, exploration does not fit the business model. So it's uh, while exploitation has very high level of complementarity with existing assets. So you know how you can make money out of the exploitation right away, okay? And finally, the culture of these large mature organizations is typically very conservative. You basically just, if you're profitable right now, people just, you know, think, well, nothing will change. Um, I started very carefully the case of Kodak, which I'm sure you, you, you know used to be the largest uh, manufacturer of uh, photo cameras in the world and, and, and rolls. And of course it failed. And um, interviewing the managers, that was a, a very profitable, high margin company. And then they knew that digitization was coming along, but they thought that it was 20 years down the, ro the road, so they didn't do anything. In fact, even when already their, their competitors were selling digitization products, they still thought that it was 20 years in the future. And when the tsunami came, they were too late. And this is a very typical example. There's about 30 examples I, 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 I uh, tell my MBA students and uh, the companies or executives I work with from different types of industries that show exactly the same pattern again and again. You're profitable, you think it's going to run forever, and typically when you realize that something is wrong, it's too late. An ironic thing about Kodak example is that if you don't know, you will be really surprised. Kodak, in fact, did invent the digital camera. Its R&D people did invent. Think about this, okay? What happened, of course, when engineers came to the business model, to, to, the, to um, senior managers, senior managers did not see the point. They came to the board and said, here's this digital stuff that actually is much better quality, but it doesn't fit. Salespeople don't like it because it's a completely different business model. And you know, we will kill our existing product. So what happened is that they killed this digital stuff. And people in Kodak who developed left and later were hired by other companies. The same thing, by the way, happened with another company that survived, IBM. IBM engineers did invent personal computer. But IBM happened the same, which IBM used to sell huge mainframes the size of this room, okay? And it's a very different business model when you sell a huge mainframe and you know, salespeople used to invite their customers to expensive restaurants for dinners because if you sell one mainframe, that's your business in a month, okay? When you sell personal computers, then you have to sell hundreds of thousands of them and you can't invite your customers to, to, to expensive French dinners. Well, IBM people did invent. IBM engineers did invent personal computer. They came to the managers. The managers were excited initially. They went to the sales and salespeople said, well, we can't make money out of that. So IBM killed personal computer. And what happened, of course, that IBM was almost went bankrupt because of that. Now, IBM did turn around, and I will tell you in a second how it did, okay, and where Kodak did not succeed. So what can you learn from Silicon Valley? Um, well, one thing is just whatever space you are in, um, go to Silicon Valley and try to see what's happening right now in your space. You will be surprised. I'm pretty certain about that. But there are three ways, I think, that you can deal with this within your company. There are three ways to innovate in the disruptive world while in fact still retaining your core business. The first one is internal innovation, which is creating innovative culture and setting up innovative incentives within companies. This is where Kodak failed. This is where IBM almost failed. Now, do you know how I, why IBM still exa exists, why LBM, IBM is still one of the largest and most successful companies in the world? Because Louis Gertner, who was the CEO at the time, or new CEO, realized that this huge, large company of 100,000 employees is too conservative. 
that the PC business that was in the early 1980s, the PC business is not going to be developed with this large company. So what he did is that he established a startup within a company. He established a separate PC unit that was even geographically allocated differently from the main company. And initially, it, was, it had its own, it had the same engineers, by the way, but so it shared engineers with the main company, but it had different finance office, different salespeople, different marketing, different everything. So different logistics. Something that doesn't make sense because whenever mergers and acquisitions happen, the very first thing, you know, you, you, you try to minimize costs and logistics. Well, he did exactly the opposite. But only because of that, IBM, because it, it did have the best engineers, quickly could develop PC. And of course, in three years, the PC business unit was larger than the mainframe unit of IBM, just in three years. Okay? So the question is how to do this internal innovation. Obviously, I have very short time, so I won't be able to tell you in details that typically it can, I can tell you for hours about each of these options, but I will give you just one example later on. Another one is think about outsourcing innovation by acquiring startups. This is what's happening a great deal in Silicon Valley. In fact, there are a lot of international acquirers these days that come to Silicon Valley with the idea of partnering and acquiring startups. And I will provide you an example in a second. And finally, and this is happening more and more, is basically establishing an arm within your company that is called corporate venture capital. Basically companies that invest directly on your balance sheet, invest directly in startups. So let me give you quick examples of all the three. The first one is uh, internal innovation. Again, there are many ways to do it. I will be able to, I have time to talk only about one. And I'll give you an example of Qualcomm. So one of the challenges with internal innovation, your employees don't have incentives to innovate. That is one of the biggest challenges in, in established companies. So how Qualcomm is doing it? So Qu Qualcomm is a pretty large semiconductor firm in a very, by, the, by now, a very traditional industry. It's a large firm, it has 27 billion in revenue, 8 billion net profit. Well, it's in danger of disappearing because semiconductor industry may disappear pretty soon. I actually think it will disappear five to 10 years down the road. What Qualcomm does is run in internal intrapreneurship. So intrapreneurship means that entrepreneurs within the company, internal, internal to the company. It runs uh, intrapreneurship contest, uh, contest, competition. It calls Venture Fest. It's held annually, all employees are eligible. There's a culture around this venture fest where basically employees in teams can propose projects um, on anything that is related to whatever the company is doing. It's like internal startups. It's like a startup garage at Stanford, but just in Qualcomm. And uh, it's over 1,000 employees, engineering employees in Qualcomm have participated, which is more than 30% of the, of the workforce, of the engineering workforce. So actually it's a very popular stuff. And Qualcomm, if you submit a project and if you receive funding, um, so it's 20% of proposals re receive funding, then uh, engineers, those who receive funding, get 20% of their time to devote to this project. And importantly enough, if they fail, nothing happens to them because they still have 80% of their main time. So they're not penalized. You're not penalized for if you fail, but of course if you succeed, then you have high-powered incentives. So there is at least uh, 25 of these projects that generate, one of the projects actually generates now five billion in revenues. Think about this. One of these internal projects in a startup generates five billion out of this 27 billion last year. And they started only in 2010. And um, for these internal projects, what's happening is that you're giving high-powered incentives. So if you're in a team that is later acquired by the company, that actually you get about 10% of the net profit. So the team that is within, engineers within the company are now very rich. That obviously gives a lot of incentives. So no failure, uh, punishment on the one hand, and very substantial incentives on the other hand. So um, Qualcomm CEO, CEO told me that uh, they, about 1,000 patents uh, resulted from this competition. 
So this is just one, one example of one company, how it's doing it. Cisco uh, is a classical example of acquisitions. So they bought 50 billion in revenue, 10 billion net profit. Cisco has acquired about hundreds and hundreds of startups. And uh, what they do is that they determine a niche in the market that has potential. They find the best three companies in the niche and then they acquire them. And the trick is that they do it very smartly. So I've been shown that I'm already almost out of time, so I won't be able to tell you how they do it. But if you're interested, you should learn about how they do it. Because the trick in acquiring companies is not, how you, is not whether you acquire them, but how you acquire them. Most acquisitions fail because the integration of innovative startups fail. Let me give you my final example, corporate venture capital. I chose an example that completely outside Silicon Valley. I'm sure you've heard about a company called Castro. If you haven't, you use it all the time, as long as you drive. Okay? Well, the question the board discussed one day, what would Castro do in a world that does not need lubricant oil? It's a UK-based company. They created InnoVentures. So this is a company completely outside Silicon Valley in the United Kingdom, very traditional industry. They did create their corporate venture fund. They came to the valley. And I will just finish with one quote from the CEO of Castro who told me, the people we met in Silicon Valley helped us realize that the future is already here. We saw technologies in development that we had no idea even existed. So they now spent more than $75 million on partnering with startups, on acquiring startups um, through their corporate venture arm. Okay? And it's about 17%, 48% of top 100, 17% of remaining 400 companies in Fortune 500 these days do have corporate venture arms. Okay? Now, if you are established mature company, then I think you have to think seriously about how, do, how whether to establish corporate venture arm. The challenge is, is that most of these corporate venture arms fail. That's because they're not done properly. And uh, because they're done using the bureaucratic process, the culture within the company that typically fails. So um, I don't have time, but you will get the slides obviously. And uh, you would like, you, oops, sorry. You would like to consider all these questions if you would like to set up an innovation or a corporate venture capital arm. And you would like to get some outside, outside expertise for those uh, either practitioners or academics who dealt with the corporate venture cap arms. Just my last number for you is that I went to the corp I was a keynote speaker at the Corporate Venture Summit in, in Silicon Valley recently. At this point, there is 1,200 corporate venture arms who just came there. 1,200 companies who do have, from around the world, who do have, and some of them is amazing. My last example is um, retail business. In retail business, uh, there were about 20 companies. One of them is a supermarket chain in the United States called 7-Eleven. If you've ever been to the United States and see 7-Eleven, it's a small supermarket. It's a su chain of small supermarkets. What do they have to do with Silicon Valley? Well, it's now one of the most interesting um, corporate venture arms that exists in the world. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, then please do email me. Um, I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.